Hello and welcome to the long-awaited fourth episode of the Backyard Space Show, brought to you by the good folks at the Backyard Space Program. Uh, some of you may already know this episode is roughly a couple weeks late, and we are pretty much past the release schedule of episode number five, but that's okay, right? Better late than never. Um, so we've, you know, been messing around with new equipment and stuff that we want to try to probably put into the later episodes, uh, I was going to talk about it tonight, but, uh, you know, it's not really put together enough to talk about, so, um, other than that, the only other news, we're <clears throat> still trying to get the website up and going, just working out, the, some kinks, and, you know, how that goes, so, we'll let you know more, once we know more, so, let's get on to, uh, a little bit of the news so some of you if not all have already heard of this summer's upcoming eclipse in the United States uh, but just in case you hadn't on August 21st 2017 as some folks are calling it the great American eclipse Americans and visitors alike will see this amazing event from the west coast to the east 86 uh, let's see 8600 miles to be exact starting in the state of Oregon and ending in the state of South Carolina, which in an eclipse of this magnitude hasn't been seen in the U.S. since 1979. The area of the greatest duration will be in Carbondale, Illinois. You can basically Google Great American Eclipse of 2017, and there's literally hundreds of news stories on this topic. Um, you know, BSP and us here, we're going to try to cover it, if at least from our vantage point here in, uh, you know, the first towns like Southern Virginia. Uh, however, um, you know, there's going to be a pretty good place where you can see the path of totality because I know in Virginia we're going to be slightly outside of that, so uh, I think Tennessee, but we'll know more about what, you know, where we'll be able to get a good video of it um, later on this year, so more on that later. So this month, uh, scientists studying the rumored to possibly be habitable planet Proxima Centauri b, who uh, orbits the Class M dwarf star Proxima Centauri, who is part of the larger binary system Alpha Centauri. Uh, the planet, which is estimated to be four light years from Earth, is our closest neighbor to Earth aside from the very own planets in our so solar system. Uh, initially, scientists determined Proxima Centauri b orbited its parent star's habitable zone and may support life. However, recent studies have predicted it may be a desert planet. Although it orbits the habitable zone, M-dwarf stars are uh, known to be frequent with uh, high-energy X-ray and ultraviolet flares, so, uh, which would be hell for any planet nearby to that, that star. So. Studies suggest the planet formed in a habitable zone that was further away from the dwarf star in its earlier days and had formed, maybe could have formed a hydrogen rich envelope around it before coming closer to the violent flares of its sun. So it still may yet be habitable. Only further studies will reveal the truth about our closest interstellar planetary neighbor. Uh, more on this can be read at skyandtelescope.com. Alright, so now on to the topic for tonight, which is targeting easy and worthwhile celestial objects after you've gotten all the necessary gear for the job. Tonight's episode will kind of be split into two uh, distinct parts. Uh, targets, which are great for those starting in visual astronomy and for those who have moved up to astroimaging. Some targets can be seen very easily with the naked eye and are easier for visual astronomy with the telescope. And there are targets of both seeable and unseeable with or without a telescope, which are better suited for astroimaging. However, there will be targets who are on both lists for their simplicity to find and track. So, the first target for tonight is going to be an obvious one, the moon. Okay, our closest celestial neighbor has been the target for astronomers and dreamers alike for hundreds and thousands of years, being revered by cavemen and modern mankind. 
This target is bright and easy to see, which makes it even easier for targeting and tracking with your telescope and mount. You would definitely want to use a filter because uh, typically in this situation a moon filter before pointing your telescope towards it because after all it is reflecting sunlight uh, despite what the flat earth community might claim. Um, eyepieces are perfect for this target or probably about 20 millimeter to 10 millimeter. For closer examination uh, between 10 and 4 millimeter are perfect as well. Um, this target is also great for astro imaging first timers for the exact same reason. Um, if you're using a DSLR, you'll want to make sure you have a high aperture between maybe about f18 or f22. I mean, you can depending on your camera, you can start lower, but my you know every time I've tried to take a picture where I wanted to capture detail, you kind of have to turn down the aperture a little bit to shoo away some of the brightness. Um, you might even have to lower your ISO as well. The second target is uh, the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters in different cultures around the world. This uh, sacred constellation is a collection of bright stars tightly knit to form a uh, very... Eh, so it's, it's bright, but sometimes hard to see with light pollution in the sky. Uh, this target does meet all the requirements necessary for being both a visual and an imaging target. Alright, so target number three is our closest galactic neighbor and is actually suggested to be much larger than our home of the Milky Way. I speak, of course, of M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. This is somewhat okay for visual, as you truly need dark skies to see even just the fuzzy haze ball, which is, uh, sits nestled within the Andromeda constellation just to the left of the Pegasus constellation. However, for first time images, this is prime real estate. This is on the list of everybody who's uh, just getting started, you know, you see a lot of them. But it is a fun object to uh, target. And, um, you know, if you don't uh, have a tracking mount that you can use, if you're using a manual mount, then I, I really suggest getting one of the Star Map mobile apps uh, for the smartphone. Um, it will really help out. I mean... You can see it with the naked eye, but you have to, like we said earlier, that you have to have really dark skies um, to see this because, you know, binoculars might help, but even through a telescope, it looks like a fuzzball. It's not until you image it that you actually get to see the, the accretion discs that surround the core of it, so... Alright, so target number four is pretty obvious, the uh, Orion Nebula. It's another object that was valued by ancient man and is a bright object, at least seen as another star within the tunic of the Orion constellation. Just below the furthest star to the right on Orion's belt is the star known as Alnatak, where you'll see three dimmer stars, um, which the star at the bottom of this three is uh, the area you want to scan when you're looking for this target. Visually, it will be seen as a bright, fuzzy light emanating from the brightest stars nearby, but its beauty is truly seen when imaged. With long exposure uh, imaging and even filters such as hydrogen alpha, oxygen 3, and sulfur 2, you can see some great variations of this, um, this celestial being in many colors as different gases are highlighted throughout the variation of it. <clears throat> but uh, it's still one of my personal favorites and another object like Andromeda where a lot of first-timers like to do it because it's in the winter here at least uh, where we're at um, it's here all winter and it's like one of the brighter objects that you get to see so all right so target number five is the dumbbell nebula uh, this object which is much smaller than the ones we've talked about thus far it's not so easy for first-time visual astronomers, nor should it really even be on the list for first-time imagers. But, however, with the proper tracking mount alignment, this object can be easily discovered by your mount alone. If, uh, like we said earlier, if you're using a manual mount, 
<clears throat> you'll want to at least use one of the great star map mobile apps that's uh, available for smartphones and uh, this object can be found within the constellation of Volpelcula. So. Alright, so continuing with this, another smaller object, it's the uh, ring nebula for number 6. With the telescope of the proper aperture and focal length, these smaller objects can be seen a lot easier. Uh, but obviously, as we mentioned in previous episodes, aperture comes at a premium. So as for astro imaging, again, you'll want to take into account what we suggested for the dumbbell nebula for targeting and tracking it. These objects look great with image, though, and when stacked can be some of your favorite captures. It can be found in the constellation of Lyra. Target number seven, the Horsehead Nebula. It's another object residing in the constellation of Orion and near the star we mentioned earlier with Orion's belt uh, over it as on the far left of the belt is Alnitok. It sits another, <clears throat> sits another famous and highly viewed image, the Horsehead Nebula. Uh, shaped like our favorite equestrian mammal. It's especially another favorite of astrophotographers, providing lots of diversity in both visible color and the invisible color spectrum, with the proper filters, of course. So, <clears throat> that's another good one uh, that a lot of people do. Um, Alright, so moving right along, uh, target number eight. <clears throat> we'd like to mention is binary stars. We wanted to mention these for what it's worth, uh, although to split binary stars or to be able to tell the different uh, difference in brightness, to tell that it's not one star but two, you'll need a telescope with a high focal length of at least over a thousand millimeters. So many stars we see above that are bright are actually two stars and orbiting one another in a long dance until they're fate arrives. So, um, Dobsonians with a long focal length are pretty good for this. Newtonians, um, at least from our experience, that they're pretty well can go ahead and you know be powerful enough to split uh, the star into a binary. But they are pretty interesting to see, and each one you see is different. You know whether they're blue or red, or you know depending on their their age and size. So uh, this is a pretty good one to image um, as well as getting to see visually so it definitely earns a spot on this list so the next two objects that we're going to talk about are in the m81 group uh the first of which is the cigar galaxy which by its conspicuous name is named after its odd shape this is galaxy is known as an irregular and is a great target especially for imaging and possibly visual use as well. It's uh, you're going to need a pretty good focal length and aperture to be able to pick up these smaller targets. And uh, the eyepieces, <clears throat> for me at least, help as well. Using a smaller eyepiece uh, to try to pull it in. Sometimes you can have trouble focusing, but uh, it's worth a shot trying to see these. Because uh, I mean, there's all kinds of irregular galaxies. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about. So. And that brings us to our tenth and final target for tonight's show, the main stage of the M81 group, M81 itself, Bode's Galaxy. This is reminiscent of the second target, Andromeda, and it should be as it is too an elliptical galaxy, which not surprisingly is also the class that our Milky Way resides in. A beautiful target that uh, many astrophotographers like to do wide field shots capturing both Bode's and the Cigar Galaxy in the same shot as both of them sit near to one another in the constellation of Ursa Major or better known by some people as the uh, Big Dipper and that's about it Alright, so this list was neither in order of greatest to least, nor was it all of the great objects available for first time astronomers. There are like, uh, there are literally thousands, if not uh, millions of objects to be had, and upon gaining more experience and closer inspection, uh, there's 
billions and trillions of little dots out there to see so um, we implore everyone to turn their gaze you know up as it's all our duty to observe track and catalog all the objects that we can see in our observable universe um, so for now this is the conclusion to our theme of first time astronomy as we will be moving forward to uh, to new topics um, new additions to the show and much more uh, we really appreciate everyone who views and supports our show but watching, commenting, liking, sharing, and critiquing what you see here uh, and our organization, you gradually help to make it better and more of a benefit to you guys, the, uh, the members. So, And even for non-members alike, we urge you to join. Uh, it's free, so why not? Um, as soon as we work out all the kinks, like I said, we'll have the official Backyard Space Program website available to everyone for learning sharing and a lot more that um, we can't wait to tell you all about so stated above we request that you give us your suggestions either for how to make um, the show better and uh, ideas and improvements in general uh, so that's it for tonight we hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoy uh, making it for you so we wish you clear and dark skies, and remember to shoot for the stars.